You're listening to The Authenticity Show, where you get to eavesdrop on great conversations about health, creativity, and the quest for excellence. Your hosts are Carlos Casados and Satch Purcell. Our guest today is Dr. Jeffrey Moore. Dr. Jeffrey Moore is a research scientist at NASA Ames Research Center. He has a very long and impressive resume, including being the imaging team lead for NASA's New Horizons mission to the Jupiter system, the Pluto system, and the Kuiper Belt. And he provides leadership and participation on many other NASA planetary mission science teams. Uh, His research focuses on a range of topics relating to the geologic evolution of planetary landscapes and crustal materials, and on and on and on. So the point is, Jeffrey Moore knows what he's talking about. So this is a great conversation with a real expert about space exploration, NASA, the search for extraterrestrial life, and all kinds of fun stuff. So let's get into it with Dr. Jeffrey Moore. All right. So good morning, both of you. I'm so excited for this today because of um, not just because it's an authenticity show episode, which Satch and I love to do so much, but um, in particular, because I've known this guest for, God, I don't, how many years has it been? I, I was 30-ish. 30-ish, yes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm 50 now. Uh, I've known you when you were 18. Uh, yeah, like, you could do the math. <laughs> so it's pretty awesome. Um, and of course, you know, Satch and I have known each other since, uh, well, since he was 14, I was about 15, 16, something like that. So really long time friends in this circle here. Um, and of course, we are speaking to Dr. Jeffrey Moore of uh, Ames NASA Research Center. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, welcome to the show. Thanks. All right. All right. So, you know, um, uh, Carlos has mentioned your name so many times over the years, and just about like cool stuff that, that, that this friend of his does and has been involved with. And um, so it's finally time to uh to get into it and and hear about the things that you've done and maybe we could have some uh, some fascinating conversations we never know where this is going to lead so it'll be fun to find out where we end up okay yeah jeff um the first question i have is actually um uh, totally about your interest so how did you become interested in and, and what's that path that you took to get into doing not only geology and space geology, but NASA itself? How did you go into that path? Okay, well, that's a good uh, a, a story. Um, well, of course, I was born in 1953. Uh, and so um, Sputnik happened when I was four years old, which I actually barely remember. Uh, and so there was a big you know, the, the space age had arrived in full force, you know, as I was a kid, you know, like I was, you know, uh, even before I became a teenager. And so there was a lot of enthusiasm for, you know, space exploration, you know, um, uh, I kind of got the bug, you know, to want to go, you know, uh, think about what other planets would look like and things like that. And my, my parents encouraged me, they, they got me a nice little telescope when I was, um, I guess 12 or something. And then, you know, I would go look, look at the uh, planets in the sky with my telescope. And uh, I just wanted to, to be involved in that. Um, and at some point there were, there was an old book series that was uh, sent out as kind of a serial about every other month in the mid sixties called the time life science series. And uh, one of the books that's out of the planets written by the unknown um, astronomer, Carl Sagan at the time unknown. Uh, <laughs> and the other book was, um, you know, human space flight, which was written by the obscurely known at the time because 2001 of Space Odyssey hadn't been made yet, Arthur Clark. And so, you know, they planted those books also planted the idea in my mind um, that not only, you know, that the way you think about planets, you think about them as geological, geological places. And, and so that made me connect to, you know, geology and, and planets. So, um, I, uh, you know, uh, like most people led a kind of a um, nonlinear life in the uh, late 1960s and early 1970s, which included a stint in the military. And I uh, got out. Uh, went back, right? huh? the, you were in the, yes, the yeah. Army. Yeah. Uh, I um, got out of the service. I, I used the GI Bill to get a, an undergraduate degree in geophysics. I actually got out. Uh, 
just before the uh, Voyager mission flew past, uh, missions flew past to Jupiter in 1979. Wow. And my dad thought I should be a lawyer because he knew I was good, a good bullshitter. <laughs> important prerequisite to being a lawyer. Um, uh, but I was so you know, excited by the amazing views of, of uh, uh, Jupiter's you know, planet-sized moons, each one different from each other. I said, you know, heck, I'm going to, I'm going to do what I've always wanted to do in the first place, I become a planetary uh, uh, geologist. So I uh, went down to the University of Oklahoma Geology Department because I, I grew up in Oklahoma. And um, there was a young professor there who uh, had gone to Cornell. So he'd been exposed to the people who do planetary geology, who had just the right background. And so I got an undergraduate degree in uh, geophysics. And then I went off to Arizona State University and got my um, advanced degrees in planetary geology from a people who specialized in that field. And then I uh, moved to Ames and um, and that's kind of the, the story of uh, how I became involved. And I've lived to see all the worlds. Um, well, let me put it to a different way, to, a different way to say it there. When I first started looking at the planets, no one knew what any of them looked like really close up. None of them. Uh, and I remember, you know, running home to see, you know, the pictures on, uh, you know, television of um, the Mariner 4 flyby of Mars back in, 1965 and, and things like that. And so I've gone to see all the planets observed close up, you know, from Mars to Pluto in my lifetime, from having them all being dots in the sky when I first got interested in the subject. Wow. That, when you put it like that, that's, that's amazing. Jeez. Yeah. It's um, very romantic. It is. <laughs> I love it. How do you feel about that? Well, it's, extremely you know i'm extremely lucky to have been involved in in this work i'm extremely lucky to have been born in a moment in history when you could say what i just said that you've seen you know all the uh, worlds go from dots to places in your lifetime that that we know of i have a dear friend of mine who lives up in, in san francisco who is one of the founders of modern planetary geology and he's 91 years old he still you know <clears throat> clears the bell you know he was born the year that Pluto was discovered, for well, instance. And yeah. so um, he like participated in 1930, yes. Okay, 30, so, yeah. um, so he uh, uh, actually participated in some analysis of the data. And so I, um, he was included in our, our big, you know, initial results paper we published in Science. And I, I like the poetic uh, 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 aspect of a person born the year the planet was discovered writes about you know what we see when we send a spacecraft there neat that Ooh. is so neat so I I am i correct um if if i remember this accurately uh you've been basically involved in every major mission that we've had for the last what 20 years or something right well not every major mission i've been involved in a few of them i um uh, my first big mission was uh the galileo mission which flew in the 1990s um uh and studied jupiter's moons um okay. and particularly made important discoveries of its uh, ice covered ocean world europa which we can talk about more in a minute Looking forward uh, to that. and then i was involved with and for a long time i was involved with one of the mars rovers so actually was there were two rovers that were sent down to mars uh in the early part of um the 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 present century, like two, they arrived in 2004. Uh, and I became involved in that mission around 2005 or six. And, uh, Second curiosity. It was, it, no, no, it was before them. It was spirit and opportunity were the two oh, rovers. That's right. And, uh, and I worked on both of those rovers until uh, first, the first one failed around 2009. And then the last one ran or operated until 2017. So, you know, for almost, 12 years I was getting up and, you know, uh, going in bright and early in the morning, you know, uh, several times a month to do rover operations for my, for my office. And so I slowly spent better, more than a decade you know, doing fuel geology on Mars, uh, via the, via the, uh, the rovers. And that was an ex it's completely different than the kind of, you know, results that, uh, are work that you do from doing flybys or orbiters. And I've been involved with the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. I'm uh, a, uh, a collaborator on the, their high-resolution camera, and I have continued to do and still do lots of work on orbital observations of Mars. 
And probably the highlight of my career was I was the head of the imaging team, uh, the geology geophysics imaging team uh, of the New Horizons mission, which had a, uh, a big flyby in 2015 of Pluto and its moons, uh, and then went on to fly by uh, what's called a Kuiper Belt object, which are these things in the realm beyond Pluto, where you know comets and things come from. You might remember the, remember the pictures of a, a, a little object that looks, looked really weird, looked like a, a, a snowman in space. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, little That's feature, that little object, is called Arrokoff. Okay, I was I can ask you if that was MU Amon or whatever that. Yeah, it was MU sixty nine, and then they it, yeah uh, it then it, uh, had an unofficial name of Ultima Thule, but the official name that the IAU, the International Astronomical Union, gave it was Arakoth. So that's what its 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 official name is now. Um, and now I'm involved in, although it's and we'll launch it in about a, about a year and a half, is a mission to go specifically study uh, Europa, the ice-covered ocean moon of, um, of Jupiter, and the mission's called Europa Clipper, and it should get there around 2030. So I, you know, I'm uh, eating my Wheaties and all that good stuff, you know, to uh, you know, stay online to be involved with that mission uh, when it arrives in about uh, eight years. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. We're going to keep oh, you healthy. That is so exciting. Oh, my gosh. Wow. It's, it's, it's super exciting. Um, uh, Something you mentioned a, a little a little bit ago is um, you you mentioned um, you know Arthur C. Clarke's you know uh, two thousand one Space Odyssey and I'm curious um, now that we're well past two thousand one right um, how how correct was Kubrick's vision compared to what you know <laughs> what did well, you get I can right tell you a lot of on? things um, first of all uh, that film came out when I was fifteen years old and it was truly mind blowing we all you know, uh, um, it, it really was, you know, um, comparable ones for a psychedelic trip, you know, as being so mind opening and so astounding that, um, that, um, it really literally changed people's lives in in any ways. I, uh, yes. And, uh, um, I can show you an example of something that you can easily see would be 2001 a space odyssey. And that is of course an iPad. You remember the astronauts are watching, Watching BBC right. 12, a uh, little broadcast about their mission on their iPads while they're in their mm. uh, centrifuge. So you got that right. And of course, is, is I, it true that the, that the outfits too were also kind of modeled after that? Maybe, but I know I know that uh, uh, Jobs said that things that he saw in 2001, he said, yeah, let's let's invent that. That's a cool thing. We should have one. Mm. So <laughs> the, rest, the, re, the rest is history, you know. Um, oh. And you know, there are, uh, no one ever know what the, what the Jupiter system looked like. But you know, there's a scene towards the end of the movie when the uh, spacecraft of Discovery is getting entering the, the Jupiter system. You see him flying past Jupiter's moons. That was entirely somebody's imagination, but yet they they mm. um, they were plausible in their appearance. Um, and you know. Uh, Everything the film was, you know, was possible. It could have happened by 2001. It, it requires, as usual, the political will to, you know, invest, you know, um, the resources of, of, of countries and the planet in things like moon bases and missions to, to you know, manned missions to Jupiter and so on. Um, so those things didn't really come about. You know, we don't have our, you know, it's 2001. All we got was a terrorist attack on the World Trade Center instead of a moon base. But, you know. <laughs> the real world doesn't quite work out the way you'd like it to work out in that sense. Yeah. Well, speaking of real world and, and, uh, envisioning, what are some of the stranger coincidences, as I guess you could say, uh, about things that you've seen, uh, like, like the one you mentioned where, where, uh, in your work, you're seeing something that, that is oddly, or strikingly similar to to the way it was conceived, or or something that was predicted in a science fiction that you began to see happening actually in in uh, your professional life. Well, you know, I, probably the most uh, uh, uncanny experience was um, people saying, "Well, this could happen, that could happen." That then you really see it uh, was when we got our first uh, um, uh, images um, of. Uh, Saturn's moon Titan. Now, Saturn has a moon that's amongst uh, has many moons, but it has one particularly large moon that's amongst the largest moons in the solar system. 
but it's completely shrouded by basically uh, photochemical haze, which those of you who've been living in LA for a long time know all about that, that <laughs> smog is, right? So it, you mean, uh, you know, uh, Titan has the worst smog day ever, every day. So much mm-hmm. so you can't see the surface, uh, um, except in the very far, you know, uh, wavelengths of, you know, the, the, the deep red. Um, and in fact, the system we used to actually image the surface was synthetic aperture radar, as opposed to, you know, um, the camera systems, although the camera systems could make out some details through, through the haze uh, when they use their red filter. So people knew after the Voyager flybys back in the early 1980s that it had this thick atmosphere and they had a, but they knew it was basically made of about 90% nitrogen and 20% and 10% uh, methane. And they could just do basically physics and make a guess about, you know, what is the methane doing? And so one of the predictions that might be doing is that uh, Titan might have, you know, uh, methane rain and methane lakes and methane oceans, but nobody really had their head around the idea when you actually uh, could see the surface that you would in fact see all these methane rivers and methane lakes um, and vast sand dunes. You know, it, it's a, um, it's a very, very strange world. I mean, it looks a lot like the American, like the Mojave Desert in, uh, in images. The only major difference is the temperature is like uh, 90 degrees Kelvin, which is, is, is extremely cold in Fahrenheit, like I know, minus 350 or something. I, I have the number wow. on top of my head, but it's very, very, very cold. It's so cold that methane, which is natural gas, like, you know, it comes out of your mm-hmm. stove, liquefies. So do you have a, a no smoking sign that you paste uh, over? You the- don't have to because there's no there's no oxygen, so there's nothing oh, okay. to mix with the methane, so nothing can blow up. You know, <laughs> in fact, if you wanted to take a cigarette lighter to tighten, you'd fill it with oxygen. Oh, wow. <laughs> very interesting. Oh, very very interesting. Yeah. So the met- yeah, the methane and the oxygen simply have switched roles in, in what's what's the oxidant, what's the propellant, right? Um, wow. And um, like I said, it you know it, it's uh, it, you have to bear in mind that you know uh, in, in the Mojave Desert, you know it's it's rock, often granite that's being eroded to, to make the make the hills and the and the gullies and and the uh, 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 you know valleys and things. And uh, on uh, Titan, it's mostly you know extremely cold water ice that's that, that's being eroded. So you know these these raw materials have uh, have um, have. Uh, replaced each other and what's what in the earth on the earth water is doing the work carving the carving the rivers uh on um titan it's methane that's ca- carving very hard water ice to make the same valleys and landscapes mm-hmm. that i say are, would be reminiscent of what you see out in the mojave desert wow. well you, it's it's ice so is there is it actual water ice or, or it sure is, is yeah i wasn't that, that, there's such a thing as another kind of ice I, i'm not well it's, there are there are such things other kinds of ice but this is just extremely cold ice and as ice gets really cold uh-huh. mechanical properties do change a little it becomes more brittle it really does behave you know, um just like rock does although like relatively weak rock but still it uh, it's mm-hmm. you know it has very rock-like properties Something like um, I don't know shale or limestone or something like that. Yeah, I like limestone. That'd be a good comparison. Okay. Mm. So does that mean that that because there's water there that that there's also oxygen? It's just it's just not mobile. Like the oxygen. Yeah, is I mean, of course, the ox- oxygen is bound with hydrogen to make the make the uh, the water bedrock mm. or the ice bedrock. You might call it you know bed ice instead of bedrock, but. So what would happen if, uh, or theoretically speaking, if, if you ignited or you sent um, uh, a powerful explosive onto the surface, would that um, just kind of go dead? It, it wouldn't burn? It wouldn't mobilize those molecules and turn into... Well, uh, I mean, explosive, an explosive carries its own, you know, uh, uh, chemicals to, to, make, to make the explosion. So yeah, if you set off a... a um, explosion on titan well you have an explosion on titan but it's not gonna i mean if you set off a big explosion if you like used to uh nuke or something sure you could vaporize and melt some of the water that uh that would be in the target and indeed large impact events um that have occurred occur, occur occasionally on uh titan do um 
uh, make little melt ponds. And people thought about the possibility that you know, these melt ponds might last for thousands of years. There's also a tremendous amount of organic material on the surface of, um, of Titan. Now, it's not, to our knowledge, uh, living organic material, but it's, since I just said earlier that methane is producing all this smog, and smog itself is, a, is a, a made of organic compounds, you know, these uh, temporary, you know, crater lakes would be filled with these, these organic compounds, and who knows what might happen to them. So what are some examples of organic compounds that you might find or, or that you know that are there in those? Well, so, I mean, all the, um, you know, all the, all the so-called canes, like alka the alkanes, like, you know, methane, propane, um, acetylene, um, uh, hydrogen cyanide is a very popular one, HCN. Wow. Um, uh, I mean, we don't, think of it as an organic compound per se, uh, because it's poisonous to, uh, to us, but, uh, it's, it's nevertheless a, a simple and commonly found, you know, chemical compound. And, and so, you know, there's kind of a witch's brew of stuff that, um, can be mixed into these crater lakes and, um, and how far these things evolve into more sophisticated, you know, um, uh, uh, the more sophisticated chemistry. Well, we'd like to know, in fact, uh, there's a new mission. I'm unfortunately not involved with it, although I'd be in my mid 80s, even if I was called Dragonfly, which is going to actually put a, uh, a drone on the surface of Titan uh, uh, in the mid 19 uh, mid 2030s. And it's going to fly around and sample what's going on in these little lakes and on the sand dunes and things like that. So we'll learn a lot more about the chemistry of what's happening um, uh on Titan in about 15 years. Neat. You know, I, I was going to say, you know, in, in a lot of industries, um, I mean, every industry requires a certain amount of planning, but I've already noticed in our conversation that, that some of the planning that, that you're talking about is like 15 years later. I mean, it's, it's a tremendous amount of planning. Like, like, like how much more planning is involved in this compared to most industries? Well, okay, I can give an example. I'll give an example of Europa Clipper. Uh, um, and this is also that something that's true, particularly people who study the outer planets, which is what I largely mm. have studied, although, as I've said before, I've done mm. work with Mars. Mm. And um, mm. Mm. so in the case of Europa Clipper, mm. uh, soon after mm. we made uh, these amazing mm. discoveries about the nature of um, mm. the ice-covered co uh, ocean world mm. of Europa uh, orbiting mm. Jupiter, there was plans, uh, so, you know, people began to discuss the idea of flying uh, missions specifically just to study um, uh, Europa. And so those discussions began in the uh, late 1990s. And in fact, there was even a briefly a proposal to... Um, to uh, 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 maybe have a, a mission to Europa uh, and uh, proposal requests were sent out and people responded to those proposal requests and so on. Uh, but ultimately nothing came of it. Um, so throughout uh, the first decade of the present century, there were an enormous a number of succeeding or successive, that's the right word to use, um, science definition teams of which I served on several of them, which continued to fine tune, you know, what we would want to do. We had sent a mission to Europa and um, what kind of instruments you would fly, what kind of observations you would make and things like that, or, or should you send down landers, all like kinds of things were evaluated. And this process went on until uh, 2015. So finally in 2015, NASA decided uh, not in any small uh, part, thanks to the help of a otherwise politically conservative uh, congressman from Texas who made it his hobby horse to make this thing happen. So while he doesn't believe in evolution and, and you know, and so on and so on, he, because he's probably my age and got the space bug probably the same time I did, had it as his, you know, uh, thing to, you know, um, uh, uh basically four speed money to NASA to support a, a mission to Europa, which finally uh, the, the uh, uh, political alignment was in place. And so in, in 2015 resources finally became available to do the Europa mission. So at that point, people wrote new proposals to provide instruments and the instruments have been, you know, been funded and built. The spacecraft is in the middle of being constructed as we speak. In fact, 
Uh, Carlos uh, is a friend of um, the senior scientist at JPL who runs all the scientists, uh, Bob Papalardo. Yep. Uh, is the, uh, is the, is the project scientist of Europa Clipper. In fact, you guys should interview him sometime. I'd love that. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, as I say, now the mission is, uh, we're in final assembly of the, of the, of the spacecraft and its instruments. And we plan to launch it on one of Elon Musk's rockets in two years. And it gets there in, uh, 2030, uh, and it has a, a, a three-year so-called nominal mission, which is the you know the mission you you sign up and say you know, for mission success you will do this much in this case x numbers of flybys and things like that and observe x numbers of specific targets. Uh, um, but of course, these missions always carry sufficient resources that you, you will get an extended mission, which will almost inevitably you know do two you know twice as much. <laughs> twice as much or sometimes three times as much observations as the so-called nominal missions. So, um, you know, so it'll be a contest to see, you know, what lasts longest me or the uh, spacecraft. So mm. we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll do the, you know, <laughs> but I just tell you the story to point out that something that began in uh, the 1990s, you know, um, when I was in my early forties is something that's going to, you know, be something I'm going to do when I'm 80. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I I was going to say, I heard, I heard a story, you know, um, uh, Dr. Mario Martinez, who did a lot of um, research on centenarians, told a story where um, they, were, they were interviewing this 100-plus-year-old man. And um, uh, he took the researchers outside to show them the garden that he just planted. So, I mean, he's in his house, right? And uh, like, wow, this is incredible. He's like, will you see it in a few years? So the idea is you have this guy who's a hundred, but he always had optimism for the future. So, <laughs> so there you go. You know, um, um, I get. I guess you have to just be incredibly patient, and that's got to be hard for people that are so curious. Yeah, and it also you would make you have to make um, commitments to uh, the people who come after you to do particularly outer planet work. Um, Legacy. I mean, classically, classically, for instance, uh, the mission to Pluto. Um, <laughs> at some point had to pass a major committee uh, in the 1990s, of which um, uh, a scientist named Don Hutton, who was a professor at the University of Arizona, very famous uh, uh, atmospheric uh, scientist, um, uh, strongly supported the mission going to uh, Pluto. And, um, and Don at the time was already in his seventies. Um, and he said that, you know, uh, I don't expect to be alive when it gets there, or if I'm alive, I don't expect to be aware of the mission happening, but you know, we should go ahead and do this. And indeed Don died before the, um, mission did arrive at, uh, uh, Pluto, but you know, he was serving as many people served on these, uh, um, committees to, to promote, uh, missions, uh, and invested a lot of their time in, in, you know, uh, thinking how they would be executed and trying to get, you know, political support for them to be funded and things like that with little expectation they themselves would benefit from it. And in fact, um, we have, are right now going through the last, uh, a uh, few details of what's called the decadal survey for the planetary science, which is, Something that the uh, that NASA commissions uh, the uh, National Academy of Sciences to perform every ten years to lay out you know where NASA should be what kind of missions NASA should be supporting in planetary uh, space exploration over the next ten years and uh, I was involved in, um, not on that survey itself but as a major source of input to that survey. Um, you know, what we should be doing for the outer planet uh, missions. And, and I have a, several colleagues who actually served on that survey who were also interested in outer planet missions. And so when we see what the survey's report, which is going to come out in a couple of months, says, almost all those missions are things that people like myself and a lot of my friends who were involved in the survey probably won't be around when the results come in. But we, you know, thought it was something that needed to be done. And, uh, and I think that kind of feeds back to your question about, you know, the idea of being very curious, but having to be patient. You have to be so patient that uh, you're going to pass it on to somebody else to, to find out what it was that you're curious about. Mm, so, yeah. Like building pyramids or something. In the, in right. the, <laughs> yeah, that, that's um, so cool. Uh, that's encouraging, isn't it, Satch, to, to know that, that, that there are yeah. people with think tanks or surveys or these different committees that are that are um, going back and forth and really trying to figure out what is the best way to spend the funding, spend the energy, spend the focus of the academic research and all that. Um, yeah. That's that's great. 
yeah, I mean, like, when, I got, when I got involved with the uh, um, Galileo mission in the 1990s, you know, that all was decided back in the 1970s. Amazing. So, you know, I just walked in and took advantage of all the work these guys who've been working on it for 20 years made it happen. And, and 15 hey. years from now, when when people are doing missions that were proposed uh, in the current decadal survey, you know, uh, young scientists will walk in and, and have the opportunity to be involved in these missions that, that you know, they were in, you know, diapers or something when, uh, when these <laughs> ideas were first being promulgated uh, and explored. But well, as they say, you know, we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. I mean, I think that's very true. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if NASA has a, uh, a program or, or a, a project called Legacy at some point. Mm, it's a good name. Yeah. You know? Well, they're talking yeah. about now a, a, a mission which hasn't been funded yet called Interstellar, which is a 50-year-long mission in which they are already very seriously exploring um, you know, how do you, um, you know, deal with succession? Because clearly the people who build and fly it, very few of them, if any, will be around when the mission, you know, uh, comes to its uh, conclusion. Mm-hmm. So people are already beginning to think about generational issues on these extremely long missions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, as you're talking, Jeff, I just, you know, all of these questions are coming in. So I hope I can remember most of them because, uh, you know, you say something and then you too, Satch. Yeah, same thing. It's yeah, like, oh. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, a, a little while ago, you were talking about um, kind of, I don't know what the term you use, but kind of you were talking about a coordinated mission with uh, Elon Musk's rockets. And mm-hmm. the question I have um, is actually prompted by a friend of mine. Um, what's the general attitude these days in NASA with uh, these privatized space ventures that are going on, you know, um, all of them. And, and is, is it, is it cooperative? Is it circumspect? Is it, is it excited? What, what's the mood around those kinds of things? Well, I, I think broadly, you know, uh, individuals within NASA, like such as myself, and this is all great. And, uh, you know, strong support, um, uh, the, you know, private, uh, enterprise in space. And clearly, you know, Elon Musk, for instance, provides life services, which are, you know, extremely difficult to uh, to not want to take advantage of. You know, they could reliably place you know large payloads in orbit and onto. Let me close the door. I think the dog is sure, sure, sure. Picking, picking up the dog or not? No problem. The dog's picking up a satellite feed and is, is alerting everybody to some new data that's been discovered. It could be a flying saucer. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so let me go back. So let me re-say that you want to edit out me dealing with dog barking. Um, so, yeah, as I said, you know, I, it, lot, people at NASA, certainly individually, are very enthusiastic about, you know, um, particularly the services that Elon Musk provides as far as launch uh, uh, vehicles. Um, uh, he can provide uh, access to space for very large payloads uh, at a fraction of what it is traditionally has cost NASA to, to launch things into space. Uh, it is a... Uh, um, Boosters are seem to be uh, highly reliable, and so uh, there's a lot of um, of confidence and uh, indeed enthusiasm for using, for instance, uh, Elon's you know Falcon X rockets uh, and Falcon heavies, uh, because it means that with within the relatively constrained budgets of NASA, we can basically get you know more bang for the buck. We can you know we can uh, we have more money available to, to spend on instrument development or or you know, supporting the science teams that uh, otherwise would have to go to pay for some very expensive booster if we had to purchase boosters from the more traditional vendors. So neat. That's a straightforward neat. example of how you know we greatly benefit it, benefit from it. And for instance, Elon Musk's uh, business provides you know astronaut launch services, which are um, much less expensive than say the space shuttle was to send people up to the space station and things like that. So are the, we're happy are, to contract with them in just the same way that, you know, when, uh, when I have to go to a conference uh, in Washington, DC, you know, I don't take a NASA jet. I take United airlines, right. And right, NASA right. pays for the services. So the same rules basically being applied here that NASA pays Elon Musk to put people into space. And, you know, we don't worry about the pers- you know, uh, a, uh, having to actually run the service itself. Of course, they had to still pass all kinds of regulations and inspection sure. things, but yeah. Are, so yeah, it's a good thing. Are, are there any downsides that, that you see? Not obviously. Uh, I mean, that's like asking what's the downside to commercial aviation to versus government owned aviation or something like that. Mm-hmm. I, you know, um, okay. 
I'm sure there are some, if you thought about them long enough, but there aren't any obvious ones that I can think of. Um, even, uh, let's say, uh, researchers, developers, engineers, astronauts being more drawn to the commercial side than, than NASA or anything like that? Well, I don't know if that's a problem for NASA. I mean, um I mean, NASA is basically a government agency which wants to explore space and um, is, and how much NASA can uh, do that is a function of how much uh, money uh, Congress, the president and Congress allocate to NASA. So I think from NASA's perspective is that, you know, it's a um, an entity which has money for space exploration and if private enterprise has people and uh, rockets and landers and all kinds of things that can, you know, uh, that we can, we NASA can pay them to go do something we want them to do on contract. Well, I don't see what they're, what, I don't see how that's a bad thing. I think it sounds like a good thing to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I saw an article a while back um, about, I think it was, uh, I can't remember the name of uh, Jeff Bezos company. What What is it again? Blue Origins. Yeah, uh, that that they were doing, uh, they were ordered to have NASA oversight because they were doing some shortcuts or something like that. Do, do you recall the issue at all? Very vaguely. I do know that Blue Origins was in competition with uh, Elon Musk's business, SpaceX, to provide um, a human uh, lander, lunar lander for um uh, the uh, Artemis project uh, to put people back on the moon this present decade. Um, And uh, uh, Bezos' business uh, lost the uh, uh, competition during the the, the, uh, contract bid. And uh, there was some grumbling, uh, unsurprisingly, on the part of uh, Blue Origins about that. Uh, And they went back and forth. But I think the dust has kind of settled and, uh, and uh, SpaceX has the contract, not Blue Origins. Now, of course, you know, Bezos has lots of money. If he still wants to spend money on building lunar landers, uh, then he's, you know, there's nothing preventing him from doing that. Um, of course, they all have to pass, you know, the same kinds of regulations, you know, FAA style regulations to operate uh, that uh, an airline has to pass, an airliner has to pass. Um, but uh, I don't think there's, I mean, I, obviously Bezos wanted to have the you know bragging rights that he provided the landers, sure. and also wanted to get money for it too. Um, uh, but that's the only really downside that I can think of to you know the fact he lost a, a, a NASA contract to provide the, the landers. It's it's good for NASA that people are competing to provide landers, so you can pick who good you point. think would be the best service. Yeah, good point. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, what what was the, the reason that from your perspective and your understanding why we haven't gone back to the moon for any, uh, 50 years? Yeah, in 50, 50 years. years. What's the deal with that, basically? Well, the deal with it, of course, this is expensive. And it was particularly expensive, you know, uh, using the kinds of, of uh, you know, readily understood technology, which is basically, you know, a polo era technology, you know, which yeah. I'll remind you of polo era technology was basically sort of souped up World War II technology. Right. But it was always impressive. We ever went to the moon in the 1960s, sure. considering that, uh, you know, it was, we were barely technologically able to do it. It was a tremendous technological challenge, you know, that uh, um, we should never downplay that you you know, uh, it, it's comparable as a technological innovation with, you know, the development of all the uh, uh, electronic devices that came out at the beginning of the 21st century that uh, mostly Steve Jobs is responsible for. They're, they're almost unimaginable that you can have things like, you know, like, an, like a smartphone or a, an yeah. iPad or things. Those can be taken, taken for granted now, but, you know, when you watch science fiction films of the Nine, you know, made in the mid 20th century, you know, things like that. You, you don't see them, people having things like that until like the 22nd century, the you know, some vastly, you know, uh, forward future uh, date. Um, so this, you know, as everybody knows there was, you know, political competition with the Soviet Union to, um, you know, which the two ideologies and which the two superpowers is going to show that uh, the, uh, the ones that had the greatest you know, technological prowess is a, a proxy for, you know, um, you know, uh, the vigor and vitality of your, of your society. So, you know, they were comparing rocket sizes. They, yeah. Mm-hmm. So they were very much, you know, trying to, um, 
to, you know, make it happen. But it, it's, 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 it was a situation with just, the, it required enormous technological innovation and it cost a bazillion dollars. And so it was just always idea in the heads of um, people. And they talked about uh, going back to the moon. So that's going to cost, you know, a huge amount of money. And, and again, NASA's had fairly constrained resources since the Apollo program. During the Apollo program, NASA got 3% of the federal budget. And, and um, since then, it typically gets less than one half of 1% of the federal budget. That's a huge decrease. In fact, to give you a comparison, you, uh, you know what federal agency has a, has historically had a budget almost identical to NASA's? No. The Drug Enforcement Agency. So oh, wow. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, compare and contrast uh, the emissions or, or utility of one over the other, but just to put things in perspective, I will. <laughs> think about, uh, <laughs> uh, just put things in perspective, that's the kind of level of funding the government has historically spent on space exploration in the last 30 years. That is an interesting factoid. Wow. I did not know. Yeah, I, it sounds like you guys are doing a lot with a, a, a relatively small budget in comparison. To a that's right. We do a lot with it's it. It's a lot. And, and well, so the idea of going back to the moon was simply not feasible. But again, uh, bec- and uh, in no small uh, um, uh, thanks to people like Elon Musk in particular, who developed you know far less expensive uh, um, you know launch vehicles to get uh, you know large payloads into space, and an interest in developing um, you know viable uh, 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 spacecraft that should travel to the, you know to the moon and ultimately to Mars and land on the surface. Um, does it become, you know, something feasible that we can, uh, um, you know, with a reasonable budget, you know, uh, you know, hire uh, Elon Musk, for instance, to provide rockets and uh, and uh, landers to uh, to you know send people back uh, back to the moon. I mean, I read an article uh, not too long ago about how much oxygen is trapped in the soil of of the moon and how it's enough to basically created atmosphere uh, to to f- for people to breathe basically for for the foreseeable future like there's so much there is that correct well um if they could extract more careful there is a tremendous amount of oxygen bound uh in the silicate rocks i mean a uh, basic rock on the earth is basically uh in its simplest form of silicon oxide so silica atoms and oxygen atoms attached but those are very strongly bounded and it's a uh, Literally, you have to not just melt, but vaporize rocks and 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 split the atoms to liberate the oxygen uh, from rocks. So that would be um, very challenging to do. But oxygen isn't really the biggest problem with the moon. The moon's problem is it has a lot less water than people thought it would have uh, prior to the first rocks re- being returned from the moon in the late 1960s. And so one of the reasons why uh, people were not... Um, Gun ho to uh, 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 set up lunar colonies uh, right after the Apollo program was the fact that the rocks brought back by Apollo turned out to be extremely dry. Now, there's been a lot of work done in the last 15 years to see if there isn't um, water molecules as such trapped uh, in um, the polar caps, or not the polar caps, but the polar regions of, uh, of the moon, the permanently, permanently shadowed craters that basically the sun never. He never rises, uh, never hits the the, uh, the floors of these craters, right right at the poles of the moon. Um, and there does seem to be uh, some amount of frozen uh, uh, ices uh, in that location. Mm. Uh, and if that turns out to be a substantial amount of, of uh, frozen ice, and then that would greatly solve the problem of you know supplying uh, um, human operations on the moon because uh, not only do you need water, but water very importantly, and quite easily can be broken down into hydrogen uh, and oxygen. So you get your oxygen from water, mm. you get hydrogen, which you can use to refuel your rockets. So you have all these, uh, um, you know, uh, tremendous advantages if you could find, you know, uh, viable sources of uh, water on the moon, which is what we're, is actually the major thrust of, of lunar exploration in present uh, uh, decade is to understand what are the water resources of the moon. Th- mm. That makes sense. I was wondering about that. Um, and now that you put it with, with the water supply, that, that makes a lot more sense. Um, Cause I kept thinking, you know, wouldn't it be uh, financially advantageous to have uh, a scientific um, station set up there and, and experiments and those kinds of low gravity and, 
and, and everything. But no, that makes sense. Um, the the flybys they did when they mapped the moon uh, was it not clear that those polar ice uh, areas were filled with ice until recently? Well, uh, by definition, they're in permanent shadows, so it's a little more of a challenge to uh, understand what's going in going on inside a permanently shadowed crater. Were they using standard cameras, or were they using some kind of imaging equipment? Well, again, because it's a uh, uh, it, they're permanently shadowed, there's no sunlight, so therefore, you know, uh, you could use some ultra sensitive cameras that use starlight to see what's going on in the floors, which they have used uh and there are other types of of um of uh, instruments you can uh, uh like radar and right. uh, lasers and other things that you can use which have their own illumination source uh and that's what they have used and they can also look to see if there are um molecules coming off the, the surface in fact um nasa Ames research center which is you've uh, mentioned i work at um actually was involved in a, mis- a mission called Laddie, which uh, was a payload which um, uh, hitched a ride with uh, the, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter when it was sent to the moon about more or more than 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, Laddie was a, uh, a, um, a, uh, uh, an impactor which uh, um, flew in and crashed into one of these uh, apparently shadowed uh, craters of the moon I'm and just ask you. flying right behind it was a set of instruments which looked at a kind of, of a material was blasted up from from the from the crash and that was used to see that indeed there you know was still uh, how abundant and how easy it is to to mine we don't know but are there you know molecules like water in these craters the answer is yes but we still have to find out how much is there there? Is it like, you know, 1% or 10%? Are they in thick lenses or are they, you know, uh, dispersed, you know, um, you know, finely attached to, you know, grains of, uh, of uh, lunar soil? You know, is the deposit, you know, uh, a foot deep or is it a mile deep, et cetera? There's all kinds of unanswered questions about how much water is there and how easy it would be to extract it in a, in a, in a, uh, in a manner which made it uh, viable as a source of, of uh, raw materials for people living on, on the moon. Mm-hmm. Uh, when they crashed it into the surface, I, I don't know if, if my memory is failing me here um, or confused, but I remember hearing something about the, the sound that they measured the sound as it, as it hit the surface. Uh, and they were making some educated guesses about the, the, um, the density of the, of the moon itself, uh, maybe some people were saying that that, that it it sounded hollow. Is, is, there, is there any truth to that, or or, or is well, that just okay? First of all, they yes, we have done these experiments uh, several times of the moon. In fact, the uh, Apollo uh, astronauts all set out seismometers on the all at their different landing sites, um, and um, during that um, um, during those missions, uh, we would take the, the the spent third stages of the Saturn V, which used to launch the astronauts towards the moon in the first place, and they would be crashed into the moon, and the seismometers would listen to the shock waves that pass through the interior of the moon. And the moon would, uh, um, for lack of a better term, sort of ring as a, as a consequence of that. Now, it didn't mean that in any way it was hollow. Uh, it did raise the issue of, of whether it was an iron core uh, at depth or not. And I know more recent work uh, has looked into trying to understand whether there's a small metallic core in the center of the moon or not. And there was a um, a separate mission flown in the last 10 years called GRAIL, which um, were <laughs> two, which were two um, uh, uh, s- satellites which basically didn't have any substantial instruments per se in them other than very highly uh, reliable uh, um, atomic clocks and radios and small changes in their relationship to each other as they went around the moon was used to make very high resolution gravity maps of the moon so you could see where all the mass anomalies and everything wow. in the uh, the moon were located and that turned out to have a lot of very interesting results in lunar structure down to great depth so um so all those things have been applied to have a much better 3d understanding of how the moon in, moon's interior is like both the seismometer measurements made 
uh, during the Apollo era and then this more recent set of measurements done by GRAIL in combination of the results that are coming back from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which carried like a dozen instruments, you know, cameras, all kinds of things. To, and it's still very much in operation, still continuing to return um, high quality data. And all those things are available uh, um, easy to find on uh, their website. So you simply type in Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter or GRAIL or NASA lunar exploration, they'll point you to the URLs. You can see really cool pictures, okay, images and data products that have been produced by uh, these missions. Uh, and they're just kind of cool to look at. And you even have to have mm. a better understanding of what they're telling you. Just, I think they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, uh, you know, uh, aesthetically pleasing, you know, cool, uh, and kind of mind boggling images to stare at. Well, it was, was it, it- was it Grail as in Holy Grail or Braille as in feeling? No, Grail as in Holy Grail. As in Holy Grail, got it. Those would be some great pictures maybe post on our page. You know? Yeah, yeah, check them out. <laughs> yeah, some things like that. So, okay. Jeff, um, you know, considering that these these projects, you know, can be, you know, even 20-something years, you know, in the planning, it seems like when a plan first starts to come together, you have no idea what technology will be available by the time the plan is executed. Right. So how how, do, how how has that affected these kinds of things, or or have have there been plans that um, relied on hoping that a particular technology would be available by the time? Well, that's a good question, and I can. And in order to get anything built and funded by NASA, I had to go through a, a, a review by very skeptical engineers. And so what that translates into is not only do you not fly the latest and uh, most recent development, you actually fly something that's about typically five to 10 years old by the time you actually put it on the spacecraft. So you know that it's um, it's going to be ultra reliable. So mm-hmm. we always kind of go uh, to the other planets, you know, um, with equipment that was already, you know, uh, on, on the general market, uh, maybe 10 years earlier. And by the time it actually gets to the outer planets, it's, you know, another 10 years have passed. So, mm-hmm. so you, like, for instance, we flew past, um, uh, Pluto in 2015, we were mostly using instruments that had you wanted for commercial availability, um, to use them commercially on the earth would have been available in the, like in the 1990s. So you always show up with, uh, with the, uh, um, electronics that you otherwise have uh, discarded and lift in your drawer in some sense <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it was a terrestrial case but but that obviously is important because if you you know you, you if something goes wrong you're kind of screwed you know in space if you can't replace a camera you can't yeah. replace instruments you know if something goes bad you're you know that uh, your options are limited so you you you're you practice extreme uh, uh, engineering conservatism in uh, yeah. spacecraft uh, design and construction. Yeah. And, and, and there's nothing more skeptical than an engineer, right? I mean, that's, well, that's in this case, as... it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, yeah, it's great. But, well, it, I, I didn't think about that, but it does give me a little more comfort just thinking that, yeah, it's, it's well-tested, tried-and-true things that you're sending up there. So even there's if there's, whole, even if there's, there's a, a whole category of like 10 different levels of confidence that, that, that uh, a, a piece of hardware is not just vaporware. Mm. Um, and, and you have to uh, uh, be pretty high up on the, you know, engineering confidence uh, uh, checklist for them to, um, you know, approve of it being included in spacecraft, especially spacecraft you're sending out that's going to take years to even get to its target. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, I didn't think about that. Is, well, let's say, are you involved with, or are you in contact with the people who are involved with this new telescope project that, that just, uh, got installed out there or is in the process of getting installed? Uh, well, I know a lot of people who are involved in that mission. I mean, that's, uh, that's a run by different, um, division than the the NASA division I I am involved with the planetary sciences division and that's the okay. National physics division uh project um the James Webb Space Telescope of course it was fantastically expensive it consumed uh, was their entire budget for a decade they had wow. they built it at the expense of building anything else and it was extremely complex and so it sounds like that it's all properly deployed so we I uh, should be hopefully smooth sailing and Is it will it- make and it will produce some amazing results. 
what kind of results are they hoping for? What, what are some of the major kind of uh, mission points? What are they trying to do there? Well, I think the thing that, you know, uh, I would find it most interesting. Well, I can, I, there are things which are, are interesting, but they're not really what I do. Like they're, they think they can look at, at um, embryo galaxies at the beginning of uh, the, of the time of the universe formed only 200 million years after the big bang wow. that's extremely cool but that's also i don't do that for a living so other than just being kind of mind blown by the concept of it you know I, i'll i'll probably just simply stay tuned and see what they discover along with everybody else but they'll also use it to you know to get a much better handle on the uh, nature of um, the nearer exoplanets the nearer stars which have planets not orbiting our sun but orbiting other stars um we'll learn a lot more about the exoplanets um with uh, JWST, that's what the James Webb Space Telescope the acronym mm-hmm. is. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thanks and, for that. <laughs> uh, and, there'll, and there'll also be uh, some solar system observations. <clears throat> we'll be able to, again, study, you know, uh, this interesting, you know, um, smog covered uh, uh, world of uh, uh, Saturn. It's called Titan with uh, uh, JWST. We'll be get much better views of like Uranus and Neptune with JWST and learn about you know the nature of their atmospheres and things like that. And they'll also be a, a good instrument for studying objects in the Kuiper Belt, not only large planet sized objects in the Kuiper Belt like Pluto, but the smaller ones such as the feet, such as the uh, object Arrowcoff we flew past uh, in uh, 2019. Are they not also discovering now that um, there are many black holes much nearer to us than we originally thought? Uh, they always are discovering more black holes. And I think the more you discover black holes, the more you're going to find some are closer than you, the first ones you found. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I don't know they're finding black holes that are only a few light years away. I think oh, most of the black holes we know about are usually many, many light years away. Um mm-hmm. And again, I don't do light holes. Uh, I'm not a light, I'm not a black hole uh, uh, scientist, so I don't can't speak of any real authority on them. But to my knowledge, uh, uh, they will study, you know, so, some of the interesting high energy physics that go on around black holes. But um, I, uh, I don't know more about it than that. Because I've seen this sort of uh, map that was created that shows uh, li- like a a shape of our current observable universe. Uh, and it's this massive network that looks quite an, a, an awful lot like a brain uh, uh, neuro map, you know, the, the right, 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 right. And, and it, and it talks about these, um, these, I don't know if filaments is the right word, but these no, filaments are what they call them. Is yeah, that what they call them? The entire universe of which, you know, one little dot in, the, in this, in those filament maps is, is our galaxy yeah, and then our galaxy, we're one star out of 500 billion stars. So, you know, it's, it's just mind blowing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Then, then these these pathways that go between places. Uh, uh, do you have any idea? What, like, like, what is that? Those, those little pathways that go from place to place. You're talking about it almost like a, a interconnection, like a super highway or something like that it was the analogy given. But well, what's I, what that? I. I the nature of the filamentary structure of the universe is obviously being driven by gravity and other things. It probably has also something to do with how it has expanded since, you know, uh, it was formed. Um, you know who you should have on this podcast and who has spectacular graphics which show it is uh, our friend uh, hey, Carter yeah. Emart. Oh, Carter, yes. If you remember, Carter is the director of visualization at the American Museum of Natural History, Eden Planetarium, and he develops um, all those shows. It's like they had a show uh, that they had for the public a yeah. few years ago called uh, uh, Dark Matter, which is extremely interesting and discussed exactly this topic. So, okay. Well, would you uh, help to facilitate that? Because I lost contact with Carter. I have contact with Bob and with David uh, Grinspoon as well. Right, right. Uh, uh, and, da- and David would be a great person to talk about all these new, these new missions to Venus because David really is a mission guy, uh, Venus guy. Yeah. yeah and he's also great. an exo, uh, uh, you know, an astrobiologist. So if you want to talk about, you know, uh, when, where, how, what, et cetera, about life in the universe, he, he's a perfect person to talk to. So Great. Okay. You know, I want to people, to, well. people to talk to, David for Venus and for uh, astrobiology, and Carter just goes, and also he, he can bring to the table some spectacular graphics. That would be, yeah, that would be wonderful. That would be great.
No, I'll be mm-hmm. happy to try to get get that connection. Okay, yeah, because I lost. I, I know uh, uh, my mom has spoken to him a few times uh, because of the Buzz Aldrin connection between uh, my mom and him. Right. <laughs> I won't even ask, Carlos. It just sounds interesting. Oh, it's but... nothing naughty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I wasn't going to ask. My mom used to work for Buzz Aldrin um, at his home and and stuff. Uh, and oh, that's so, cool. Yeah, Carter would call in and was connected with him in some kind of project work of some kind. Yeah, you know, uh, in the early 1990s, Carter and I uh, shared a house, um, and um, at that time, amongst other things, uh, Carter was doing some graphics work for Buzz Aldrin. So, does he still have long hair? Oh like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's still <laughs> picky as ever, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That was when, when you lived in uh, the first house that I visited you at in Mountain View, yeah? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's right. I, I remember that. Boy, we, we listened to some great albums in that house. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we listened to albums. I guess we listened to albums. This just shows all, all the good stuff is still on this planet, right? I mean, like a good <laughs> album. Right? Exactly. Hey, hey, Jeff, uh, you know, I, I'm curious, like for you personally, what are some burning science questions that you have that you would just be delighted to confirm or discover? Well, of course, the most the burning and most burning question of all is, you know, will we find uh, life in uh, either present life or evidence for past life uh, in our own solar system? Um, because if we do, then the ability to study, you know, uh, life off the Earth um, would be much, much easier to do than if we are... are forced to wait until we can, you know, uh, find out what's going on in planets orbiting other stars, which are vastly further away from us than the, than the planets are. Um, it's the likelihood of that. Yeah. Over well, the next- uh, that's, the, that's what's motivating the mission to, uh, to go to Europa is because it's an ice cut, uh, covered ocean world. Uh, Europa is about the size of the earth's moon, but it has a, an ocean is probably about 60 miles deep and it's covered about a, you know, a five to 10 mile thick ice crust. But underneath it is like this, this ocean because it's, you know, the, uh, since it's the size of the moon, it has lunar gravity, which means that the pressure at the bottom of the ocean floor, which is a rocky ocean floor, um, is about the same as the deepest parts of the earth's oceans. Uh, and, um, you know, life has arisen and it thrives, you know, particularly if there's any volcanic vents or anything like that on um, the floor of um, Europa's oceans. And so um, that's why we're very interested in Europa. Not only uh, uh, is it interesting in its own right, but it, it, it um, holds um, a substantial promise for being a place where um, you might be able to uh, discover if, uh, if life has arisen elsewhere um, within our own solar system. And likewise, mm-hmm. we're sending missions to Mars. Um, you know, Mars probably doesn't today have anything living on it, I suspect, just for a variety of reasons, which are almost too long to elaborate. However, uh, it did go through periods in its uh, um, early life, uh, its early existence, which were at least conducive uh, for life. Life could have lived there. Um, There's nothing about the environment that would not allow if you planted it terrestrial bug on on uh mars wouldn't have survived for an indefinite period of time and thrived so was mars did mars ever have life on it is also an extremely important question if we can find fossil evidence for that that would be you know again very very interesting now one thing though about mars is because of its relative proximity to the earth like a kindergarten in the early solar system you know large impact events would blast rocks off of one planet and some of those rocks would end up landing on another planet like we have for instance on the earth you know example of meteorites which you know originally are pieces of mars wow so we know uh the other if the process reverses itself you know you could imagine um a large impact event on the earth three billion years ago you know carrying some primitive life forms from the earth those life forms could have survived and ended up, you know, landing on Mars in a habitable environment. So if we find uh, evidence for past life on Mars, we'll have to look carefully to make sure it simply isn't the life that uh, traveled from the Earth in the first place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Of course, there's the more bi- mind-boggling concept that uh, maybe life didn't begin originally on the Earth. It began on Venus, which today is a blazing hellhole, but may have had oceans uh, three billion years ago. 
um, and that uh, life on the Earth didn't begin here, but it came from you know from Venus or Mars. So, so all these things are still being sort of sorted out now. Very likely, life formed on the Earth in the first place, and and if there's life or past life on Mars, it probably came from the Earth. But you know, we don't know until we check it out. So, so it's true that that women could be from Venus. They could be, yes. They could uh, be, right? I'm I mean, often could be from Mars. They may well be from Venus. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Venus envy, right? That's, that's what we all know. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, Jeff, it's just interesting. You, you're talking about like, you know, like if there was a volcano or something in the bottom of the ocean in Europa, you know, that that could could generate, you know, d- you know, different different things for for life. It's just interesting, just by coincidence, I, I just saw, you know, before we, we started this, I, I saw in the news that there was a volcano that erupted out in the Pacific Ocean, like this right. morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a, there a little mild tsunami warning, you know, all along the, the West yeah. Coast up there in the San Francisco area and, you know, even all the way down here. Like, I think they're saying like, you know, a foot, you know, maybe about a foot. So this is not a big risk, but, you know, it was amazing to see the satellite image of that. It's just Boom, coming out of the ocean, you're like, wow, yeah, this that's pretty explosion cool. in the ocean, you know, this that, morning. Well, there, there is a, a couple of articles I read about um, carbon-based life, and is there any other example of a life that is not carbon-based? And, and I remember reading about this researcher that found an ammonia-based life, and it was in it was exactly in that. It was it was in a thermal uh, vent under the water or something like that deep within, uh, those crevices, they found bacteriological life that was not, um, respirating the same. It was, it was, it was basically the synthesis was based on ammonia. Uh, right, right. It's still carbon based, but it, it's, oh. um, but, there's, but there's still others. There are other basic compounds of uh, ammonia and methane, uh, for instance, uh, um, are things which can be metabolized and 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 uh, very uh, primitive bacteria can uh, can metabolize them. And in fact, there's a whole series of of, of bacteria or uh, or primitive uh, organisms which uh, live off methane. And so uh, uh, the um, uh, methanogens they're referred to uh, are uh, uh, well studied um, uh, organisms, and and it's not surprising that the, these you know kind of you know what's uh, other gases, not just oxygen. In fact, oxygen is a relatively real, uh, new development uh, in uh, terrestrial uh, life that was that came about due to so called uh, so called you know oxidation events or ox- oxygenation events is the right word um, that probably took place several hundred million to a billion years after life itself arose on the Earth. And in fact, originally, all the oxygen that was being produced as kind of a byproduct of early uh, uh, um, organisms ended up poisoning many of the early organisms and it was only through evolution that then did later new organisms develop to take advantage of oxygen which was a much more uh efficient uh gas to metabolize and allowed organisms to uh become more sophisticated and better organized and so uh we think that the rise of oxygen on the earth which as i say was itself created by primitive organisms um you know was a driver for for evolution on the earth so there's oh, all these different gases. I'm kind of rambling. Well, <laughs> there are all well, these different okay. gases which can be, that can be um, that can be metabolized, uh, and the order in which they appear cause some organisms to die, but then some organisms exploit the new gas. Mm, because yeah. It turns out to be a better uh, um, a better uh, source of energy than the predecessor gases. So it's like a pr- previous generations built a scaffold that later generations would evolve to. I mean, talk about planning, right? Talk about advanced planning, you know, <laughs> from an evolutionary perspective. You know? Quite. Wow. My goodness. That's a, a, a lot more uh, significant than the pyramids there, mister. Yeah. 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 Well, I saw that funny That's meme. Sure. Talking about billions of years, not thousands of years. Yeah. 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 I saw that funny meme that, you know, uh, I think, I think uh, your gal Heather posted, Carlos about how well the pyramids it was easy it was before newton invented gravity so oh yeah it was easy to move the blocks around because you know he had yeah, the that, so yeah <laughs> um you know this morning before we started this um i went and i took my supplements and it occurred to me to mention something that sat you don't know uh hmm. but and, and jeff may not realize but my interest in nootropics came from 
uh, Jeff. Oh. Uh, yeah, when I was 18, we were hanging out and, and, and he introduced me to the concept of nootropics, uh, which are, of course, you know, uh, nutrients and, and um, nutraceuticals and chemical compounds that are, um, you know, there that, that can enhance cognition, memory, alertness, focus, uh, mm. or enhance sleep, or, you know, they, they can create these positive changes. So my interest uh, generated from you, Jeff. You, you're the you're the culprit, and I'm I'm a fanatic. And as Satch knows, I'm a fanatic about nootropics, and I take them on a practically daily basis. And I know a lot about it now. Well, very good. I still take vitamin B12 and um, super omegas, things like that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it's a, it's a really popular topic these days with uh, biohackers and folks that are into wellness and. Um, you know, uh, functional medicine specialists and nutritional consultants and things like that. It's a big deal um, in this day and age where, you know, we're spending a lot of hours doing things. It's not like we don't have as many breaks. Um, The ability to refresh your attention and to increase your recall becomes super important because those things go down or they decline as you don't sleep as much and as you have these like really long hours of focus, um, it's, it's been a, a game changer for me. Yeah. Well, that's the one, one thing I really try to do is make sure I have good sleep. I I'm used and I, you know, I realize I could stay up and do more reading and so on, but I, I do make an effort to try to get eight hours of sleep a night these days. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. You know, you know, Jeff, uh, Carlos and I even did a, a an episode on dreams and I'm just curious, have you ever, um, had any inspiration from dreams that affected your work in a positive way or any, anything you discovered in dreams? It's kind of a, a problem solved question maybe, but you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, uh, the dream state is a useful one for, you know, um, uh, sorting things out. And I'm trying to think if I can give an easy and, and, um, illuminating example, of how I solved the problem because I dreamed about it, but I do know that, uh, um, that I'll wake up from dreaming and things have been sorted. Uh, and so it's, it's an iterative, iterative process. It's part of, you know, uh, digesting an idea and coming up with a solution for it is, you know, uh, the work that you do in your dreams. So it's being done for you because, you know, I mean, yeah. of course you're obviously the participant in the source of it, but um, it's not like you can give yourself a, a dream assignment very easily. You know, your dreams sort of take, you know, dreams, the subconscious is, is 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 uh doing its bit to help out you know but it's going to do whatever it wants to do too so exactly yeah it's it's very unpredictable but kind of cool well because i I know that the uh the the whole concept of organizing the periodic table came from a dream sure sure and niels bohr famously you know got the idea of you know that the little solar system model of of what atoms look like from uh from a dream so you know lots of ideas Mm -hmm. came from and you know um, you know, I, I do a lot of visual stuff. I'm a geologist. I make geological maps, uh, amongst other things and, and try to solve. And I often solve things, you know, visually before I try to see that I can look like of a mathematical explanation for a mathematical description of them. Um, so I'm very sure that, uh, there, I, I, I am sh- quite sure there's a lot of iteration that goes on between things that uh, are, um, processed in dreams and then applied, uh, once I'm in my wake, state to uh to to things i do research on Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well nowadays there there is a huge emphasis on um studying um consciousness as it relates to the the neuroscience and neurochemistry of uh psychedelics and that's been uh just a huge there's a huge influx of interest uh scientifically and socially in that um, there are uh, budding businesses and legislation is starting to change around it. Um, it's beginning to become decriminalized in the U S and in various cities all, all across uh, the United States. And there've been millions and millions of dollars of research going into um, like Johns Hopkins university. And I think it was uh, NYU or maybe one of the New York um, universities there. Um what are your thoughts about uh, the potential for for um, positive benefit and growth in our understanding of ourselves through through that kind of thing? I know you're a child of the '60s and and you're a scientist, and 
you know. Well, I certainly think that uh, people get lots of great ideas in, uh, you know, altered states. Um, in fact, I wrote a uh, essay for uh, Lester Grinspoon, which probably many of your uh, listeners uh, know who he was. He had a book uh, titled Marijuana is Medicine, um, published, I guess, maybe 25 years ago. And in it, uh, I told the story of how I learned to um, take stereo images and, and look at them out using stereo glasses, like, you know, a, you know, a, a, a stereo viewer. And I had struggled with that for a long time. And it was uh, while being very high on pot that I uh, figured out how to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, now it's legal, so you know you can. You can all, right? <laughs> well, grandfather, even in my home state of Oklahoma, it's amazing. There's more. Oklahoma is okay, so it does, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, yeah, it, it, like my hometown's little town of you know six thousand people, and now has more pot dispensaries than it does churches. And we're talking in a very religious state, so that's saying something. Yeah. So. Well, oh. it, and it's obvious that um, you know, the rumors are totally true that marijuana destroys your brain, and you can't possibly be successful or uh, intellectually. Um, uh, clear and focused if you smoke mar- marijuana, obviously. Uh, uh, <laughs> quotes I, around that. That, I say a lot of that has been uh, has been disabused <laughs> at this point, yes. Yes, yeah. it has. Well, I mean, obviously, you mentioned talking to David Grinspoon. Well, David, of course, is Lester's son. So, Correct, uh, yeah. You know, uh, you could you I could certainly certainly have the same conversation with David as well. Yes, he, yes, and we we just might. <laughs> um, oh, that's really cool. Well, you know, um, I will uh, just go out on a limb here and say that when I met you. I was um, in an extremely altered state. Um, I think I was slowly meandering into the uh, to find my tent in the campground that we were at uh, when you you said well, hello, and I, I turned and noticed <laughs> you, and 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 I I was very absorbed in my my own journey of uh, epic proportions, getting back to my tent, and and then hearing your voice, and you invited me over to to eat with you. Yeah, yeah, you, you and your girlfriend at the time uh, were coming back because we, we had the tent next to yours, and my, my girlfriend at the time, um, uh, and your eyes were dilated. So I thought, you know, you probably would be <laughs> useful to be friendly and 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 open and say, here, sit down, join us. You know, you know, don't be a lost soul. Say here, you know, at least you'll be you'll be someplace. You'll be here. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, a really warm, uh, warm way to meet you. You introduced me to your your NASA buddies as well. And I remember we ate, I don't know if we were eating chili or what we were eating, but something warm and, and nourishing. And and uh, that was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's hard. It's still hard for me to imagine you that you're 50. I mean, I'd have met you when you were 18, but. Uh, <laughs> you know. Well, let, let's. Let's put on the the wizard's cap for a moment, get out our crystal ball for a second, and let's ask something weird and cool. Okay. Uh, this is the Authenticity Show, and um, what are your thoughts and maybe even your predictions looking into that crystal ball about what we might discover? Of course, you're, you know, we're not going to hold you to anything here. It's just some ideas here. But based upon the the recent release of data, um, the government finally admitting that there is uh, validity to the UFO reports, they just not admitting what it is, but they're admitting that, yes, for the last 50 years, we've been observing them. And there have been some um, you know, uh, video release of, of uh, F-16s, uh, radar chasing these things. There have been photographs. There have been uh, lots of officials uh, admitting that they've seen the paperwork, stating a variety of facts around it. Um, but it's still like they're, for, for the for the the average person, because we're not in the know, we, we've had some of it released. Most of it's heavily redacted. Um, there's a lot of missing data for us. Now, I'm sure there are people who don't have as much missing data because they're reading the, the reports without the redactions. But from your perspective, I know it's not your focus, but surely on your off time when you're having a cup of coffee and looking at the news here and there, you probably have your own thoughts about it. Um, A, what's the likelihood that we might get the full story at some point or close to the full story? Uh, B, what's the likelihood that um, maybe a a portion of those things aren't secret government projects and perhaps um, an example of another life form? Well, 
it's very true that you know the the, the navy and uh, and other uh, organizations which you know are constantly monitoring what's going in the sky are seeing a lot of weird things which you know uh, you know produce images on film and you know show up on radar blips and so on and visual and they're currently seeing them for for a long time um and at the end of the day it's still not clear what they really are uh some of them probably are secret uh, uh um things that are being developed by either us or other militaries um right. or by private industry who knows what elon musk is not telling us um but uh, um they are they from other, you know, other civilizations, you know, from beyond the solar system, um, or within, or within, um, you can't, just can't say. I mean, I mean, uh, NASA doesn't, you know, actually, so it isn't something NASA spends a lot of its time on it. And I, I don't have any additional information above me on what you can, you can read. Um, I think, you know, like a lot of things, you can't categorically state that they're not but you at the same time can't point to anything specific that says that they are i mean does it, it, does it, it bug you huh does it bug you a little it bit does bug me and let me here's a couple of things that bug me uh first of all is if these navy pilots are seeing some of these darn things why don't they take better cameras you know they show they show you know things which are almost interesting but they don't really show them in high resolution but i know that that when the navy does want to take pictures of things at very high resolution they do maybe they have taken them they're just not showing them to us i don't know you're redacted so far or it could be that that the the equipment is not detecting it because of some unknown scientific reason for example maybe uh they're uh not quite um physical yeah, and then and that goes to the second point that you know it's too bad we don't ever have a single strap of of, of a real artifact. You you can't well you that know, we know of we, we or we oh, right. There's nothing you can pick up. I mean, here's to put things in perspective. You know, from a NASA perspective, nothing would be would better benefit us than that we start finding you know uh, life on other planets or that did we find the evidence for you know uh, other civilizations elsewhere because you know. You know, from yeah. nothing other than you know simple expediency, it would you know it would be a great boon to our budgets, right? You know, we could sure we could show credible evidence for things. I mean, far from NASA wanting to hide stuff like that, yeah, we'd be the very first people to say if we could show you something that, that could set up, you know, uh, scientific scrutiny, we'd say, yeah, look at this cool thing, you yeah, know? yeah, and uh, and and give us some more resources to explore this cool thing. I mean, so, so that makes gonna... sense. That makes sense. But let's, let's, let's do a think tank here. Let's pretend we're, we're exploring possibilities. All right. Um, uh, if it weren't NASA's choice, but because we, we have many, many organizations within the, the U S government, some of them are, are stated and some of them are, are not so stated. Mm-hmm. Um, some are well known and some are lesser well known. Um, they obviously don't control, NASA does not control the flow of all information within the government. That's um, correct. Far from it, in fact. Uh, so if this were to be uh, deemed of military and intelligence um, uh, purview, mm-hmm. okay, which it does seem like it is because they're, they're releasing heavily redacted documents, uh, and the people who were the whistleblowers, many of them are people who formerly worked for um, intelligence communities. And that's that we we can say it's a fact. We can't verify whether what they're saying is true, but we can say it's a fact that these people have come forward and, and sworn affidavits that these things are happening. If that's the case, hypothetically, what might be a motivation in keeping it from People, if you're thinking, if you're to put your evil cap on for a second and say, "What? Not evil, just just a maybe changing caps to their point of view." What? Why would it make sense for them to to prevent us from knowing? Okay, two two quick things, and I know we're getting around of time, so let me try to nail them. Uh, uh, a lot of the redaction, I suspect, is because uh, the instruments which the government is using to see them—that's what's classified, not the not the things they're looking at. Maybe. Or at least that's a plausible explanation. I mean, usually Somebody. when I see redacted stuff, it's because the government's trying to not tell you what it has that uses to find out about things, not it is so much suppressing what they have found out. In fact, I think to it's to zeroth order until I see otherwise going to take uh, uh, their comments more or less at face value that they're just saying these are really weird things. We don't know what they are. 
in many cases. Um, and then the other issue of um, worrying about whether something's being kept a secret, you know, the famous lines, two people can keep a secret, one of them is dead. Uh, if, yeah. <laughs> if, there's, if there's a lot of stuff going on in, um, you know, in the natural world that, uh, you know, sooner than later, I would think that, you know, some person who isn't working for the government and doesn't, ha- you know, can't be controlled by the government, you know, information would get out and in, in the form of something which everybody would have to say, no shit, this is not something you can explain away other than it's an, you know, a- an alien artifact. So I hope and remain uh, eternally uh, 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 wishful that, you know, some real thing that we, that somebody will, t- uh, you know, turn into a university and they'll do it over someplace that, you know, that can do credible analysis and say, this is a real thing from someplace else. Yeah, that, that would require a lot more to, to smuggle a physical object. I mean, let's say it was a craft. That would be even a, possible. <laughs> yeah, or even just a piece of something you know, came, that came off the outside or was left yeah. behind by an exploration party or anything. Sure. And, you know, I, 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 as you know, when you first met me, I worked for the for a, a SETI Institute, the Search yes. for Social Intelligence Institute. Right. Which is still very much an extant organization, which I still have a lot of uh, relationship with. Uh, and, you know, uh, I also continue hope that they, they the, will find evidence for extraterrestrial intelligence. Um, so well, are they still focused in on radio data though? And uh, laser. Okay. All right. But they mostly, they still have to operate passively just because of the resources they have at their disposal. And so one has to hope that, that uh, extra, you know, that uh, um, extraterrestrial uh, 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 intelligences, you know, want to make themselves known. So, I mean, it'd be, it, it, since we can't really ultimately guess what their motivations are, hypothetical extraterrestrial intelligences, we, it's a puzzle that they would, you know, if they are, in fact, the agency behind uh, some of the UFOs, that they are happy to fly around our atmosphere and zip around and, and confuse and dazzle uh, Navy pilots, but then that they maintain total radio silence when you try to see hear from any one of them anywhere. Uh, right. With, with the, these intense intense searches um so you know my uh, uh um crystal ball is that you know i think we will see evidence for a life uh that is not did not originate on earth uh in the next hundred years maybe sooner uh, i love it and i and i hope that we will uh um discover that there are uh, or have been um uh, alien intelligences elsewhere in the cosmos, uh, either near or far, uh, would be a reassuring uh, and be a, a great um, relief to discover that we don't suffer from, you know, uh, uh, cosmic loneliness and we aren't the only. <laughs> and again, you know, uh, if you look at scientific phenomena, they can certainly be rare, but if there's enough of chance for something to happen in a very vast universe we just described how vast the universe was when you're talking about filaments and yeah individual specks in the filaments or galaxies the galaxies themselves have 500 billion stars etc that surely intelligence similar uh, you know as we think of intelligent uh technical civilizations you know must rise and uh, exist for a while elsewhere in the universe, but how often they do, how far is the nearest one? Uh, do they ever have the ability to communicate with each other? Those are all profound questions, which, you know, uh, light the very heart of scientific curiosity. And if we resolve any of them in my, in my lifetime, I would consider myself indeed truly fortunate. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I, I'm hopeful too. Um, I think the, the, the weight of, release of information over time has increased, even though it hasn't gone on the schedule that people have promised us. Various presidents have promised and been blocked um, and have been quoted as such that, that they that they demanded those things released and, and then they were told no, um, which goes to show you that the president doesn't make all the decisions. Um, that, that, that's a good thing. Yeah, that yeah, it is absolutely. Um, it's a good thing and it can be sometimes a bad thing. It just depends on yeah. the circumstances. Uh, but right. the, National Security Agency, essentially, as soon as that act was created, the National Security Act, it created a government inside of our government, which doesn't have the same oversight that that the rest of the government does. 
but um, that that does make things interesting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, uh, exactly. Um, anyway, um, I appreciate your answer, and and um, I'm so curious. As you know, I've always been curious about this, and and I, I like to see the trend that that more information is coming out, uh, more of these documents and and things that have been released. Uh, some of them. Are quite interesting. I think I sent you an article about one that has a full 15 page report in it. That's pretty interesting. If you have a chance to read it, yeah, um, check it out on a coffee break or something. Um, okay. But uh, this has been a fucking great conversation. And and Satch, isn't this fun? Oh my gosh, I love it. Oh it's, it's, God. It's, it's so cool. We, we we finally had a NASA scientist. Finally, so hopefully we'll, we'll we'll get a couple more. Yeah. You've been listening to The Authenticity Show with your hosts, Carlos Casados and Satch Purcell. Very special thanks to our guest today, Dr. Jeffrey Moore. My name is Oliver Altin. I produce the show. I also wrote our theme song, which you're listening to right now. Please remember to subscribe to The Authenticity Show wherever you get your podcasts. And you can find our website at authenticityshow.com. Thanks for listening and have an authentic day. Thank you.